Okay, hi, so in this video we're going to have a look at energy level diagrams. Now with energy level diagrams we can see the type of reaction that occurs, so whether it's an exothermic or an endothermic reaction, and we can see the amount of energy that is either taken in from the surroundings or is given off to the surroundings. So let's have a look straight away at what an energy level diagram looks like. Okay, so we always plot it on an axis like this, and we have energy, okay, energy on the y-axis, like so, energy, energy, and there we go, okay. On the x-axis, we normally don't really write anything, but what it actually is, is the progress of the reaction, okay. So you could think of it as over time, but normally we, we don't really care about the time on the bottom. Okay, so in simple terms, what we're going to see is something like this. We're going to see two lines. Now let's say that we've got this line here, okay, and then we have this line down here. Okay, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to label this top line uh, reactants, reactants, okay, and surprise, surprise, I'm going to label the bottom line products, okay. Now bearing in mind this here on the y-axis is energy, what does this tell us? This tells us that when we have our reactants, okay, they have a certain amount of energy, which is up here, okay? And at the end of the reaction, the amount of energy is down here, which is contained in the products. That means that what we've actually done is we have lost, okay, energy. We've lost all this energy. So this here is energy, and it's clearly been lost because the products have less energy than the reactants. So this we can call energy released okay so the energy has been released and when energy is released into the surroundings okay this is what we call an exothermic exothermic reaction okay so this here is the energy level diagram for an exothermic reaction now you can imagine that the opposite to this is going to look like so we might start with a line at the bottom and we might finish with the line at the top. And again, I'm going to label them reactants and products. Now you can see that our amount of energy that we start with down here is clearly less than the amount of energy we finish with in the products. And that means we are going to be taking in energy, okay? Rather than giving it out, energy is being taken in. So this here still represents an energy difference, okay, this is still energy, but rather than energy being released, this is the energy taken in or the energy absorbed, okay? And so when energy is taken in from the surroundings to form the products, this is known as an endothermic reaction, okay, endothermic. So these are the differences uh, simply between an exo and an endothermic reaction. In general, in an exothermic reaction, because you've released energy into the surroundings, okay, the temperature, I'm just going to write temp for short, okay, is going to go up. That's because the energy has been released into the surroundings, it's going to heat the surroundings up. The opposite endothermic reactions take in energy from the surroundings, which means that the temperature is going to go down because heat energy has been taken away from um, the environment, okay? Now that's all very simple, but I'm sure you've heard of something known as the activation energy, okay? And this can actually be included on our diagram. So let's scroll down and we'll draw another set of axes. Okay, now let's think about an exothermic reaction again, okay? So that is when the reactants are at a higher energy level than the products, okay? I'm just going to write an R here for short for reactants and a P there for products, okay? Now, so far, we know that the energy difference between them, okay, here, that is the energy that is going to be released into the surroundings, okay? Now, you might be wondering, well, um, why doesn't the reactants just spontaneously turn into the products then? Because if it can just release energy into the surroundings, surely that should just happen on its own. Well, with some reactions, that does happen. But in most reactions, you will have heard of the activation, activation, Oh, that's really bad handwriting. Sorry about that. Activation energy. Okay, that's very slightly better. The activation energy. That's the minimum amount of energy required for successful collisions to occur and a reaction to happen. Okay, if that if that energy is not um, met, if that condition is not met, then a reaction doesn't happen. And that means that even though, even though we have 
we have a scenario where energy is being released, we need to supply more energy so that those reactants are persuaded to become products. Okay, So what we actually get is something that looks like this. The amount of energy actually goes up and then it's going to come down, okay? Like so. So we can see that the activation energy is the extra energy, okay, on top of what we already have. And that is this amount of energy here, okay? So this amount of energy is the activation energy, okay? I'm just going to write AE for activation energy. You can just think of it as if we don't apply this amount of energy, then the reactants are not destabilized enough to break down because they're happy as they are. They need loads of energy for them to buzz around loads, get really unstable, and then form the products. Okay, that's a simplified way of thinking about it, but um, it does follow this trend. Now, something you have also covered are catalysts. Okay, catalysts. Now, you'll know that catalysts. Okay, what they do is they speed up reactions, okay? So they increase the rate of reaction, okay? And if you've watched my previous videos, you'll know that they do this by reducing the activation energy, okay? So they reduce uh, the activation energy. I'm just going to write AE for short at the moment, okay? Well, that's a mess. There we go, AE, okay? So they reduce the activation energy. That means that we don't have to apply as much energy uh, in order for the reactants to turn into products, which means we're going to have an energy level diagram that might look something like this. Okay, I'm going to draw it in a different color. So this is the amount of energy we need to apply when we have a catalyst present. Okay, so this here is our new energy, Okay, our new activation energy. So we might call this a C. Okay, that is the activation energy when we have a catalyst. So the energy level diagram looks different because we don't need to go as high as we do here because the catalyst is allowing us to supply a smaller amount of energy in order to allow the reaction to happen. Okay, now finally we're going to quickly discuss um, something at the end of the chapter in your book which I really don't like, which is bond making versus bond breaking. When I say I don't like it, I don't like the way that the book explains it because they don't fully explain uh, the concept. Okay, so what's happening when a reaction is occurring is that chemical bonds are being broken and chemical bonds are being made. Now, if you think of a chemical bond as a physical um, structure, okay, so this is just an analogy, um, we need energy in order to break that structure down, okay? If you were going to smash something, you smash it because you apply energy to it, okay? Bonds are the same thing. We need to apply energy in order to break them down, okay? So breaking bonds requires energy. It takes energy from the surroundings, okay? So it requires energy. So therefore, it is, oh, there we go, it is endothermic, because endothermic means that we are taking energy in from the surroundings. Okay, now making bonds, once you've made the bonds and they're happy, excess energy is released back into the surroundings. Okay, think of it as like two magnets coming together. When you put magnets close to each other, they just fly together on their own, okay? That's because they're happier being together than not being together. It's more stable for them, which means that they release excess energy, okay? So making bonds releases energy and therefore is exothermic. Okay, so making bonds is exothermic, breaking bonds is endothermic. Now, the reason why I don't like the way the book explains this is because they stop there. They don't um, say, well, in an exothermic reaction or an endothermic reaction, what's happening um, in terms of the bonds? Because now you might be confusing bond making and bond breaking with a full exothermic reaction and a full endothermic reaction, okay? Because in an endothermic reaction, it doesn't mean that no bonds are being made, okay? Just because it's endothermic, okay, it doesn't mean that the only thing that's happening is bonds are breaking, 
And in an exothermic reaction, it doesn't mean the only thing that's happening, our bonds are being made. And this is a confusion that you could come to um, as a result of the book. What it actually means is that, let me do this in a different color. So in an endothermic reaction, endothermic reaction, okay, that means that overall the process is endothermic, which means the endothermic part of it is stronger than the exothermic part, okay? So that means that break the bonds broken, which is the endothermic part, are stronger than bonds made. Okay, because making bonds is exothermic. But if the process is overall endothermic, that means the breaking bonds is stronger than the making bonds. Okay, and now, surprise, surprise, in an exothermic reaction, there we go, bonds broken are weaker than bonds made. Okay, so overall, the bonds being made are stronger than the bonds being broken because making bonds is exothermic, breaking bonds is endothermic. And if the reaction is overall exothermic, then the making bonds part is stronger than the breaking bonds part. Okay, so that tells you overall what's happening in an exothermic and an endothermic reaction. Okay, it's just that extra bit of detail um, is something that I used to get confused about when I was learning about it. And a couple of my students have mentioned it as being a massive issue. So making bonds is exo, breaking bonds is endo, and the balance between the strength of those tells you is the reaction exothermic, is it endothermic, okay? So that's something which um, is just a good way of never getting it confused. So now I'm going to stop there. Um, I hope that video has been of some help to you. If you do have any questions still uh, relating to this, then please do feel free to send me an email uh, using the direct link below or post a comment and I will be sure to get back to you. But I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Make sure you subscribe and like as per usual as there are more ones coming soon.